Good morning. Great to see you, New City. For those of you joining us for New City Live, grateful to have you joining us online today. Hope you'll continue to at 10 a.m. online as we broadcast from our South Park location. We're continuing in our study of the life of Daniel. And if you have a copy of the scriptures, I want to encourage you to go ahead and open up to Daniel chapter 6 as we start part 2 of our study. Uh, Daniel is first person historical narrative. So Daniel is telling us his story and we made it all the way up through chapter five and we took a little break there for our generosity series and we're gonna jump back in today in chapter six and we'll go all the way through the end of the book in chapter 12. So two parts here, uh, two, two uh, messages on chapter six and then we'll be into uh, apocalyptic visions. Uh, so we'll call November apocalyptic month and look at the four major visions uh, of the book of Daniel. When you get to chapter 6, uh, would you stand to your feet and let's read uh, the Word of God together. In the early church, when the scriptures were read, oftentimes people would pop on their feet in reverence to God's Word and His authority over their life. The Word of God to you today, Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 16. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces. And he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interest. Daniel soon proved himself to be more capable than all the other administrators and high officers because of Daniel's great ability. The king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way of Daniel, the way that he was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything. They couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. Verse 5, so they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. So the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, long live King Darius. We are all in agreement, we administrators, officials, officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except you, your majesty, will be thrown into a den of lions." And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so that it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be revoked, verse 9. So King Darius signed the law. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home, knelt down as usual in his upstairs room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always had done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about the law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions? Yes, the king replied. That decision stands. It's an official law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be revoked. Then they told the king, that man, Daniel... One of the captives from Judah is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled, and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. In the early evening, the men went together to the king and said, Your majesty, you know that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. Verse 16, so at last the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, may your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. The word of God to you today. You may be seated. Throughout this series, we've learned a lot about Daniel. Daniel. I've learned so much studying, and I, I hope you have too in your study time. I would encourage you to continue to read and study the book on your own. When I was growing up, some of you uh, remember my story. My parents were not Christians until I was in elementary school. I didn't grow up learning the stories of the Bible. 
It's why it's so important for us at our church and across the church, capital C, to be investing in raising up the next generation of resilient Christ followers, learning the word of God together. I didn't learn this, the scriptures until a little bit later on in life. And what I learned about Daniel was about this moment. And many of you know Daniel for this moment too. That's captured in Daniel chapter six. Daniel and the, fill in the blank for me. Yeah, you, you learned that too. You know, oftentimes we know and, and remember people for a moment, for a, for a, for a crisis moment. And of course, many of us associate Daniel best with this moment from Daniel chapter 6, Daniel and the lion's den. Winston Churchill once remarked that we should never waste a crisis in our lives. But crisis actually reveals what's within us. Crisis moments like this moment don't make people. They just reveal what's already in people. Crisis is like a, a tube of toothpaste, and, and when a crisis moments come, the toothpaste is squeezed, and what's on the inside comes out. The central truth for the message today, the, the, the bottom line that I hope that you'll wrap your heart around from the scriptures today is this. Moments don't make people godly. Godly people are made for moments. Moments don't make people godly. Godly people are made for moments. And what a moment this is. For some of you, again, growing up, you, you read this moment. You know a little bit about the story. Uh, maybe you read this version of the story, this first picture. Maybe you saw this in a children's Bible growing up or you've read this to your children. I'm not sure what's happening there. Um, but here's, here's what I can tell you. Uh, that's not reality from Daniel chapter 6. And, and what do you see in the picture that, that is most inaccurate about the story? Well, Daniel looks like he's about 25 years old, right? He's actually 81 years old. Here's another picture that might be a more accurate description and picture of what, what this actually looked like in this moment. I love this picture. I'm just going to give you a moment to look at it. What do you feel in this, in this moment? I'm drawn to the, the male lion there in the middle that's locking eyes with Daniel. It's almost like God is speaking to him. I'm, I'm drawn to Daniel's posture. What is Daniel's posture here? Submissive. He's got his arms behind his back. Can't tell if they're bound or... That's not in the scriptures here, but he's got his arms and his back. He's not, you know, we don't see Daniel here trying to climb the walls and get out. He's, he's staring down the lines. I wonder what you feel in this moment. You know, the reality is Daniel was made for this moment. If we only knew Daniel for Daniel chapter 6, Daniel and the lions, then we, we would miss so much of what God wants to say to us about this moment about this narrative. If we go back and read the first five chapters, and if you've, you've missed the series so far, or you're just catching up, go back and listen and read the first five chapters. When we read the story of Daniel, we recognize that, that Daniel has stared down death just like this multiple times. We recognize that he's now in his early 80s, and this isn't the first moment that he's faced of, of crisis that's revealed what's really inside of him. For a little bit more context for where we are in the scriptures here in chapter 6, um, let me just tell you a little bit about the Medes and the Persians, because in the first two verses here we read about Darius, which was actually a throne name for Cyrus. If you go and study the book of Daniel, you'll see these two uh, names used uh, simultaneously, and they're the same person. Darius was the throne name for Cyrus uh, the Mede. And, and, and Jim Collins' sentinel work on organizations and, and why they fail, he, he wrote a book called uh, um, How the Mighty Fall. And he studied uh, several companies that were uh, enormously successful, but in a generation had failed. 
And he tried to look for commonalities between these organizations and systems and companies for how these mighty places and organizations and businesses had come to a, a place of failure and collapse. And you want to know the number one commonality and reason that he found for these companies failing, and it gives us context for chapter six? Hubris born of success. I'll say it another way. Pride. When we come into chapter 6, what's happened in chapter 5, just for context, is the fall and the collapse of the mighty Babylonian empire. Nebuchadnezzar, this madman that we meet as a 25-year-old in chapter 1 when Daniel was 15, has passed away and there's been a succession of kings ending with his grandson, Belshazzar. And you remember Belshazzar has a big party and he parties with a thousand of his friends in chapter 5. And there's handwriting on the wall that, that tells Belshazzar that the Babylonian empire has been weighed and measured and is going to be divided. And indeed, that night, Belshazzar is killed by Darius and his Medo-Persian army, and, and they take over. You know what's interesting? Nebuchadnezzar's mighty empire went down without even a fight. Belshazzar parties with a thousand of his friends while the empire collapses. Darius comes in and begins to bring order. Look at the first two verses here in chapter 6, if you're, if you're there in the, in the scriptures. Darius the Mede, again, is his throne name for Cyrus. He decides to divide the kingdom into 120 different provinces. So he comes in, he begins to divide out. Remember, the Babylonian empire was the most expansive empire on the planet. So that makes Darius the most important and powerful person on the planet. And the first thing he does is delegate authority to 120 different governors over, uh, over different provinces that they would lead. And then, moreover, he appoints a high officer to, to, to rule over each of these governors, three of them. And he chooses Daniel to be one of them. Now, what do we learn here about the difference between the Babylonian Empire and the Medo-Persian Empire in chapter 6? Well, the Medo-Persian Empire uh, was very ordered and structured. Uh, he, uh, what Darius does here that's described in the first two verses is he sets up a government and he immediately appoints other leaders to lead and included among those leaders is Daniel. In fact, he's one of the top three leaders. And if you read a little bit further, Daniel was such a special person and leader that Darius made plans to put Daniel over the entire empire. It connects us back to Joseph in the book of Genesis being over Egypt and their captivity. And Daniel is a, a new version of Joseph that is but a forerunner of, of Jesus. Darius uh, puts these uh, officials in place, and among them is Daniel. And listen to, to verse 3 of why he was put into that position. Daniel soon proved himself. Here's an 81-year-old an, an man who's still proving himself. So if you find yourself today in your 80s, at the fourth quarter of your life, as long as you have breath, God's not done with you. There's a purpose and a meaning for every day that God has given to us. Here's a man in his 80s who is still proving himself to be faithful and godly, and moreover, more capable than all the other administrators and officers because of his great ability, the king made plans to put him over the entire empire. Belshazzar, who's the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, doesn't know Daniel. His mother has to tell him in chapter 5 about Daniel. Darius quickly sizes everybody up and says, this guy has got it. He's the best of all of them. Why? Why was he the best? The ESV says that an excellent spirit was within Daniel. So what do we learn here right in the first three verses? that we shouldn't pray for the right moment or moments. We should pray in the moments to come. If your heart is right and ready before God, if it's red hot for God, you'll be ready for every moment that's ahead. And you'll go from what's next, question mark, to what's next, exclamation mark. Daniel has spent 66 years years in captivity. 
when we meet him in the first three verses here. He's been forgotten by the Babylonians and Belshazzar specifically. As I mentioned, he's in his early 80s. But who is still the best leader in all of the land? Daniel. Why? Because an excellent spirit was within him. It wasn't about his circumstances. It was about his godly heart. If you're right, everyone listen to this. If you're right before God, if you're right before God, you'll be ready before anybody else. When we bow before God, we can stand before anyone, including a den of lions. It wasn't because, okay, just in context, it wasn't because of the right king. It wasn't because of just the right circumstance, just the right moment. No, the Bible reminds us again, it was about what was within Daniel, an excellent spirit within him. So straight away, what can we apply just in these first three verses to our moments and our circumstances? Well, don't wait for the right opportunity. Don't, don't, don't pray for just the right moment. Be ready for the moment. Don't wait for the best job. Do your best job now. Don't wait for the right person. Be the right person. Cultivate godliness in your heart now. Don't wait for a moment to make you. Pray that God will help you to be ready for the moments that are ahead of each and every one of you. And there are. Don't wait for your luck to change. Ask God to change you by his grace today. Here's an 80 plus year old man who could have crawled into a hole of self-pity and no one would have blamed him. He's stripped away from everything that he knows as a 15-year-old. He never sees his family again. When we get to the, the, the remainder of this story, every single day he opens up his windows and he looks back home to Jerusalem. And he thinks about his mom and dad, and he thinks about his siblings, and he thinks about the temple, and he thinks about the moments that he had worshiping God there, and he never gets to return home again. If anybody could have crawled into a hole of self-pity, it would have been Daniel, and yet he refuses to. Instead of allowing the circumstances of his life to own him, which is so easy for all of us to do, to just look at our circumstances, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and just say, I'm, just, I'm a product of my circumstances. And if I had just been born at a different time and would have met a different person and got a different job, I would be different. But we see from Daniel's story here that that's not true at all. Daniel chooses to cultivate godliness in his life. Instead of allowing his circumstances to own him, he refuses to give up on God. Some of you are close to giving up on God today in the moments that you're experiencing. Don't give up on God. Don't let go of what God is doing in your life. Even in the moment that you're experiencing right now. Do you remember those, those three pivotal words in chapter 1, verse 8? If not, go back and, and read it this week. First three words in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel resolved as a 15-year-old. He's 81 years old, and he's still resolving to follow God no matter what. All kinds of things have changed around him. But God has continued to cultivate his life in Daniel's heart. You know, the most important piece of property in your life is not any piece of land that you own or your house. It's the heart and life that God's given to you. The, 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 the life that God's given to you is a gift not to be owned but to be stewarded. To be lived, as Jesus said, to the fullest in Jesus is life and life abundantly overflowing. Your life, whether you feel like it today or not, is meant to be lived for the glory of God and the furtherance of the gospel in this world. The truth of the kingdom of God that marches on no matter what. So we gotta stop pointing our fingers at other people. We don't meet Daniel as an early 80-year-old going, let me just, let me, let, me, let me tell you all the bad things that have happened to me, and he could have. We don't meet him pointing fingers and, 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 and making excuses. We don't find him making uh, or finding reasons to justify his own sin or selfishness. He's taking responsibility for his life, 
And by God's grace and power and strength, he's living into the life that God has given to him. What I found in my own life, dear friends, is that God can't change my heart unless I give him permission to. That God has given me agency, he's given you agency to make a choice to submit to his will or not. And if I refuse to take responsibility for the life that he's given to me, then it's going to be very difficult for me to follow him no matter what. If you think you have an excuse for not following God, think again. Again, Daniel's been enslaved now for 66 years. He's been separated from his family. He's been threatened, as you know, if you've read the story, over and over and over again with death. He's been falsely accused. People have, just like this story, have found reasons to trump up charges against him and, and accuse him and try to kill him. He's watched his friends be thrown into a fiery furnace for following God. He's been labeled his entire life, and he will be here again as a captive, in exile, a slave. And now he's an old man thrown into a pit of hungry lions. If anyone had a reason, everyone watch this, if anyone had a reason to be bitter at God because of his circumstances, it would be Daniel. But instead, he allows God to cultivate godliness in his heart, and he becomes even better because of his circumstances. He's the best leader in all of the land, not because of his circumstances or what's happened to him, because he's cultivated a heart of godliness. I had a mentor one time tell me, and it sounds cliche, but it's true, don't get bitter, get better. By God's grace and strength, don't get bitter, get better. Allow God to make you. When you get better, bitter, when you get resentful, when you have an unforgiving spirit towards circumstances or people in your life, you're the one that gets poisoned. But what we see here, specifically in verse 4, is that outward godliness is cultivated with inward faithfulness. There's no substitute for it. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. This is more than coincidence, dear friends. This is more than just a coincidental moment. This is conviction. This is 66 years of resolve and conviction to follow God no matter what. 66 years with six different kings and now two different kingdoms And Daniel doesn't say, I'd rather be lucky than good. He says, I'd rather be godly because luck runs out, but God's grace doesn't. It never does. Nowhere in the Bible, we'll jump back in the story. Nowhere in the Bible does godliness happen on accident. You will not fall into following God no matter what in your life. Godliness is walking up a down escalator in this broken world. And if I'm not pursuing the heart of Jesus every day and surrendering my heart to Jesus, I'm surrendering my heart to the prince of this world and the lies that he brings into my heart, into my mind. But cultivating a life of following God no matter what begins by surrendering my heart and prayer before him. It's God's grace, friends, and it's your choice. God gives you agency. And life doesn't get any easier, speaking of circumstances and moments, life doesn't get any easier for our friend Daniel, does it? When the, when the Persians take over and Darius is on his throne, there's another setup, right? Here's another group of people, you know, it doesn't matter what kingdom it is, as long as it's a kingdom of this world, jealousy is always a common thing. And here's the leaders, they're looking at Daniel as a, a guy in his early 80s and, and he's got Darius's attention He's the apple of Darius's eye, and they can't stand it, and they can't stand him. And I want you to look here at verses 4 and 5, the other administrators, this, this set-up moment. They begin, to, they begin to search for some kind of fault in the way of Daniel. This is a, a, an unbelievable verse. They look for some kind of fault in the way that he was handling the, the authority that Darius had given to him. But look at this, verse 4. They couldn't find anything. They couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. I wonder if we could say that in 2021 about a politician. They couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. And why? 
Why could they, could they not find anything? Look at these words. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. That comes from within. The circumstance change, the players change, the kings change, the kingdoms change, but Daniel doesn't. His heart of faithfulness, of resolve, of trustworthiness. And so look at verse 5. Here's what they decide. Our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel and convicting him will be in connection to the rules of his religion, which actually was about a relationship that Daniel had with the one true God that they didn't understand. Basically what they say is the only way we're going to get this guy is something in connection with his faithfulness of following his God. Now here's a question for us with verse 5. Maybe just write this down in the margin of your Bible or wherever you're taking notes. If someone were trying to convict me of faithfulness, would they find enough evidence in my life? If someone were trying to convict me of following Jesus, would they be able to find enough evidence in my life? Daniel is faithful. He's godly. So they try to convict him of godliness. It wasn't because he was smart. I'm sure he was. It wasn't because he was experienced. Of course he was. It wasn't because he was political. It wasn't because he was handsome or lucky. It was because, look at verse 4, it was because he was faithful. So they hatch this, this, this plan, all the other officials do. They, they, they go to Darius and they, they appeal to Darius's pride and his own hubris. And they say, Darius, over the next 30 days, we think it's a great idea that no one would pray to anyone or anything other than you. And evidently, once that ordinance was passed in the Medo-Persian code, it could not be revoked. Now, what they don't tell Darius is that we're trying to trap Daniel. We're trying to accuse this leader that you've got your eye on. They just tell him, hey, it seems like a good idea to establish your authority that no one else should be able to pray to their God. And he says, okay, yeah, that, 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 sounds, that sounds like a good idea. And so he signs this law into being. And then we get to this setup moment. The, before we get to the lion's den, this is the context of how we get here. And before we jump into verses 10 through 16, let me just talk for a moment about how we handle our own moments. You know, how do you handle moments, especially crisis in your life? Let, let, me, let me offer three ways that, that people typically handle crisis or moments like this of lion's den. The first is that they panic, right? And maybe this is you. When you're in a lion's den, when you're in a crisis moment, whatever that look, may look like for you, it might be a, a financial thing, it might be a relationship thing in your marriage, it might be a diagnosis that you've recently received, it might be a, a meeting that's waiting on you this week, it might be a, re, a rebellious child. It, I don't know what it is for you, but whatever that moment is, pip, people typically respond in, in one of a couple of ways. And the first one is that they panic. And when you panic, when you panic in your lion's den moment, you try to take control of the moment. This is, I'm just going to confess to you, this is my go-to move, okay? When the going gets tough and there's, you know, everything's on the line and whatever, I want to grab the controls of the moment. I, 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 want, I want to be in control. And oftentimes what that leads to, if any of you struggle with this, is anxiety. Maybe you couldn't name that emotion or that feeling, but that's what it is. I feel, I feel anxious, I feel fearful, because in my lion's den moment, I've, I've tried to take control and I'm, I'm, I'm panicking. And some of you in the moment that you're in right now, or in a moment that's coming up in your life, because you guys have heard me say, you're either in a crisis, you're coming out of a crisis, you're going into a crisis. That's the reality. Jesus said it this way, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart for I've overcome the world. If you're not in a crisis, you're probably just coming out of one, or you're getting ready to go into one, whatever that moment is for you. And oftentimes in crisis, we grab and we want to we want to control it and, and, and we panic. Here's, here's the second way. For some of you, you respond this way. This is your go-to. You don't panic, you become paralyzed. You respond to these moments of crisis by being paralyzed. And when you're paralyzed, instead of you trying to take control of the moment, what happens? The moment takes control of you, and you're just along for the ride. 
the moment becomes too big, quote unquote, for you. And you're overwhelmed with it and you become paralyzed. When I was in officer training school, one of our exercises was a high ropes course that we had to do as a, as a squadron. And I'll never forget, we were up there <clears throat> and half the, half the folks in my flight, this is, I know, um, some irony in the Air Force, there are a lot of people that are afraid of heights. But we're <clears throat> up on this ropes course and we're, we're halfway through it. We're in Montgomery, Alabama in June, so you can imagine, in full gear. And the guy in front of me just, just paralyzes. Just, just, just cannot move. Cannot put a foot in front of him to walk forward and we're all in line, hooked in. We can't go anywhere. Some of you are in moments in your life right now and it feels like a high ropes course and you're paralyzed to take the next step. The moment has overwhelmed you. You don't need to raise your hand, but is that you? Most of us pivot one of two ways. We, we panic and we take control or we, we get paralyzed and the moment takes control. But here's what I really want to get across in this first part of the story in Daniel 6. Is we don't see Daniel panicking and trying to take control. And we don't see Daniel paralyzed and letting the moment, as difficult as the moment is, take control. What do we see happen here in the rest of the story, verses 10 through 16? Daniel prays. He doesn't panic. He doesn't get paralyzed. He prays. Look at verses 10 and 11. When Daniel learned about the law, he moved out of town. No. When Daniel learned about the law, he went home and knelt down, and underline this in your Bible, as usual. He's always been a person of prayer. Crisis squeezes out what's in the toothpaste tube. And what is squeezed out of Daniel in this moment is godliness. He goes to his upstairs room, and he opens up his windows towards Jerusalem, which is a a signal and a sign of hope. If you're reading your scriptures, just write hope in the margin. He, he prays towards Jerusalem three times a day, uh, trusting God that they'll return back to Jerusalem, that God will restore his people. It's a prayer of hope. He prays three times a day as he's always done. And I want you to pay attention to this. He gives thanks to God. A warrant for his death basically has just been signed. He goes home and he prays. And he gives thanks to God. And this is more than just three different prayers that he prays. What we see here, guys, is a posture of dependence and surrender on God. It's surrendering his heart constantly, which is what God's calling you to, of course, in your life, in your moment. So, of course, God wants you to pray the act of prayer. But what is prayer? Prayer is constant surrender and dependence to God. It's communion and fellowship with you and with God. And oftentimes our prayers are like this. God, would you please, would you please change this circumstance? Daniel doesn't pray that. He looks towards Jerusalem. He prays a prayer of hope and restoration. And then he gives thanks to God. He gives thanks for however God is working right now. I don't understand it. I don't know why these guys are after me. I don't know why I'm going to be you know, threatened with death yet again as an early 80-something year old. But I'm going to give thanks to you because how whatever happens, it's all good. Paul said it this way, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Whatever happens, God, I trust you and I'm going to thank you. And the guys come to his house, look at verse 11. The officials, they go together to Daniel's house. They knew what he was going to be doing because he had demonstrated his godliness and faithfulness in front of them. And they find Daniel praying, and look at the last part of the verse here, verse 11, and asking God for help. The favorite prayer that God loves to hear from each of your hearts, you want to know what it is? It's one word. Help. Help help. Daniel goes and he demonstrates his dependence and his surrender to God. That's what prayer is. It's a posture of constant surrender. And you know what it is? Back to the Jim Collins uh, hubris born of success. It's the antidote to hubris. Prayer is the antidote to pride and hubris. And instead of asking God to change his circumstance or get me out of this moment and change all this, he gives thanks to God and he asks God for his help. Whatever your will is, whatever your will is. We don't, here's the truth, guys. We don't need to take control of the moment and we don't need to allow the moment to control us because God's with us. 
And through prayer, God helps us and he prepares us and he cultivates his life within our life so that we can be faithful and wise and dependent and surrendered in whatever moment you're facing in your life. We ask him to change us before he changes our circumstances. Just parenthetically, for some of you right now, God's not changing your circumstances because he wants to change you. And you keep praying the prayer, God, change my circumstances, change my circumstances, change my circumstances. And not that he won't answer that one day, but maybe the reason why God's not answering that prayer is that he wants to do something so much greater than that. Within you, he wants to change you. Look at what happens next. Let's finish here, verse 16. So at last, they, they, they go to his house, they find him praying, they, they go back, of course, right away to Darius and say, hey, this guy, and look how they refer to him, by the way, that man, Daniel, such contempt, that man, Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, one of the slaves, he's praying to his God and not to you. And look at Darius's heart here. Darius's heart is broken. And he looks immediately for a way to find out of this. How can I rescind the law and revoke this and save Daniel? And finally, verse 15, all the, all the officials come to Darius and they say, hey, if you don't, if you don't follow through on this, basically you're not, you're not acting as a Medo-Persian king. You're not fulfilling your kingship. And it could be Darius's authority on the line. So he goes through with it. And verse 16, we'll finish here. So at last the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. And then the king says to him, amazing, may your God whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. The very last thing that Darius says to Daniel before he closes up the den of lions is about Daniel's faithfulness. Within that short period of time since Darius has come into power, he's seen the inner faithfulness and godliness in Daniel's life. And I think maybe he knows this, our bottom line today that moments don't make people godly. It's not the circumstance or moment in your life that makes you godly. Godly people are made for moments. Moments just like this. Moments that, that God might be putting in your life right now, circumstances. I, I, I wonder when you look at this again as we close, what that moment is for you. And I wonder what your response will be. Are you going to panic and take control and try to climb the walls? Are you going to get in the fetal position and be paralyzed by the moment? In prayer, will you submit to the will of God and trust that God is with you and God will rescue you no matter what? Let's pray together. Father, you are our great hope. As Daniel looked to Jerusalem, we look to you. And we pray, a prayer, we pray a prayer, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. I know for many of my friends who are facing many difficult moments and circumstances in their life, but we look to you and not to our circumstances. And when we look into your eyes, our hearts are filled with hope and not despair. We pray today the simple prayer that Daniel prayed, help us, God, help. We need your presence. We need your strength. We need your wisdom. We need your love. Change us and, and, and make us. Jesus, you said, follow me and I will, I will make you. I will make you fishers of men. Make us into the people that you want us to be. Help us not to panic in the moments that we're experiencing or facing or will face. Help us not to be paralyzed, but cultivate in our hearts today a heart of prayer and dependence and surrender on you. For your glory and for the furtherance of the gospel in this world. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Thank you so much for being here today. It was wonderful to jump back into our study of Daniel. And we'll be in the second part of chapter 6 next week if you want to read ahead. If you're looking to get connected here, if you're new or you've been coming for a while and just had uh, trouble getting connected, we'd love to help you to take your next step here and to get into community at New City. The best way to do that today is to go out to Connection Point, which is in the courtyard. We've got some teammates there. It's a beautiful day. We'd love to connect with you out there. And we have a gift for you uh, if you're new. Hey, if, if Jen and I haven't had a chance to meet you, we'd, we'd love to meet you. If you have a moment and come up afterwards, we'd love to say hello. Or if you'd like prayer, we'd love to be able to do that with you uh, today. If you're able, would you extend your hands for a benediction, for a, a blessing uh, as we go? And may the Lord today, may he, may he bless you. And may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and, and lift up his countenance, his attention towards you. And may the Lord today and all throughout the week fill you with his peace and his mercy and his presence in every moment that's ahead of you for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Love you, New City.